Captain Ed Mercer and Lieutenant Gordon Malloy infiltrate an enemy spaceship in search of their holy book, the Ancana. Aboard the USS Orville, the ship's crew gathers in the cafeteria for lunch. Lieutenant Gordon Malloy joins the group and asks Lieutenant Alara Kitan about the guy she dumped. She says there isn't anything juicy to tell. Alara has superhuman strength and this made the guy feel emasculated. Because of this, she sees no point in dragging out a relationship with their conflicting differences. Lieutenant Commander John Lamar Joe that Alara should just date Isaac, their robotic comrade. Isaac thinks this isn't such a bad idea, as he's fascinated with the interpersonal behavior of biological organisms. With this, he says he'd be happy to attempt intimate relations with Alara, but she awkwardly declines. Just then, Lieutenant Commander Bortus sees that Gordon is eating sushi. Gordon is surprised that he hasn't seen this delicacy before, so he offers some to Bortus. However, Bortus grabs the ball of wasabi and swallows it. This doesn't seem to phase him though, as he's a Moklin, and their digestive system is quite resilient. Their planet's harsh climate allowed their species to evolve and draw nourishment from basically anything. Curious, John hands him a napkin, asking if he can eat it. Bortus simply grants his request and takes a bite out of the napkin, impressing everyone. Suddenly, Gordon gets a better idea. He heads to the counter and orders a cactus plant from a machine. When it's ready, he hands it to Bortus and asks if he can eat it. Alara worries that this might hurt him, but Bortus munches on the prickly plant effortlessly. Everyone cheers for him, and even Alara tests him into eating the glass she's holding. Bortus takes a bite of the glass's rim, and once again, everyone is in awe. Gordon thinks of feeding him a bag of nails next, but they get summoned into the bridge. There, Isaac spots a Krill battlecruiser attacking Castra 4, a defenseless planet. Captain Ed Mercer gets alarmed because this is the third Krill attack in a month. Suddenly, Isaac presents visuals and zooms into the Krill ship, where they can see it firing shots into Castra 4. Bortus reports that the Krill ship's offensive capabilities are far superior to their own. Ed commands Alara to open the hailing channel, and he immediately begins talking. It turns out that Alara hasn't opened the microphones yet. When it's ready, he commands the Krill ship to seize fire, or they'll respond. Commander Kelly Grayson doubts the effectiveness of what Ed just said, but Bortus reports that the Krill ship has ceased fire. Kelly is surprised that it actually worked. To their horror, the Krill ship repositions itself to face the Orville, and now they're locked face to face with a massive enemy. The Krill ship immediately fires causing the Orville to tremble. Ed commands Bortus to fire back, but even with a direct hit, the Krill ship gains no damage. Kelly knows that if they keep on with this pounding match, their ship won't survive. Ed asks Gordon if he could take the ship to the planet's upper atmosphere, just between air and space. Gordon argues that this will create a lot of friction, but Ed disregards this, asking if it can actually be done. Gordon sighs, and he replies that it's possible. While he glides the Orville over Castro 4's atmosphere, Ed commands Bortus to prepare to launch all the plasma torpedoes. Bortus argues that this will make them virtually defenseless, but Ed tells him to follow his orders. Meanwhile, Gordon is already in Castro 4's upper atmosphere. Bortus reports that the Krill ship cannot lock into them, and Kelly realizes that Ed's plan is to utilize the planet's atmosphere as a smokescreen, which will briefly blind the enemy's scanners. Just then, Ed alerts Gordon to go upward upon his command. When the timing is right, he shoots the ship upwards, and Ed commands Bortus to release the plasma torpedoes. The Krill ship receives a massive blow, and it explodes into flames. Meanwhile, the Orville's crew commend each other for a job well done. Right after, Ed orders Alara to hail the colony in Castra 4. According to the mining chief, there are dozens of casualties, and 19 people are already confirmed dead. Ed tells him to stand by as they send medical aid. Suddenly, Kelly sees an intact remnant of the Krill ship floating in space. They retrieve this and load it up on the Orville. Admiral Ozawa applauds Ed and Kelly for salvaging the cruiser as this can help them learn more about the Krills. As they walk to her office, she explains that she only managed to gain scraps of the Krills' culture, despite their constant efforts to engage with them. She adds that technological advancement usually causes a civilization to decline its religious beliefs, but the Krills are different. They clung to their faith, even into the age of interstellar travel. So far, all that Ozawa knows is that the Krill people see themselves as superior to all other forms of life. When they attack a colony for its resources, they don't see it as an evil act, but rather their divine right. Because of this, they can't reason with the Krills. If this conflict leads to war, they will only see it as some holy crusade. Ed argues that they can't just sit by and do nothing while the Krills attack. Ozawa explains that they have to understand them and find a way to communicate in a fashion that resonates. To make this possible, Ozawa needs Ed to obtain a copy of the Ankana, which is basically the Krill Bible. To do this, he'll take the recovered cruiser across the border and infiltrate a Krills vessel. Later on, the crew prepares for the departure. Suddenly, 
Accordingly, Ed enters the deck with a Krill soldier holding him hostage. He demands to speak to Bortus, and when Bortus steps forward, he points his gun at him, telling him to eat it. Just then, Ed and the Krill soldier burst into laughter, confusing the rest. It turns out that Gordon is disguising himself with a miniature holographic projector that they'll use on the mission. Kelly gets mad, thinking that Ed isn't taking his mission seriously. Ed reassures her that he's only trying to lighten the mood, then promises to keep himself safe. Not long after, Ed and Gordon make their way to enemy space. On the way, the two formulate their Krill names, which should sound as alien-like as possible. However, their conversation gets interrupted when they encounter a huge Krill ship named the Yakar. Ed and Gordon switch on the emitters, hoping that it actually works. Lucky for them, they pass through the scanners, and they're permitted to dock. As soon as they get on board, they're summoned by the captain, Haros, and the high priest, Sazeron. Ed and Gordon panic in their presence, so they introduce themselves as Chris and Devin. The Krills think these are uncanny names, but they shrug it off and ask them about their destroyed ship, the Kaykov. Ed explains that they were attacked by a Union ship named the Orville. As he says that they barely survived, Gordon adds that the Orville must have had a pretty good pilot, which is actually him. However, Sazeron is skeptical about their excuse, and he thinks that it's strange that they're the only survivors. Ed explains that they were conducting maintenance when chaos ensued, and the shuttle just flew off after the explosion. He also adds that their prayers saved them. Just then, Haros asks the two if they have any information that'll be useful for their present mission. Ed casually asks what the mission is, but they get interrupted by the sound of the bell, signifying that it's time for their daily services at the chapel. There, they sit on one of the pews to blend in with the other Krills. Suddenly, a Krill named Talaya introduces herself and adds that she hasn't seen them before. After introducing themselves with their unassuming Krill names, they add that they came from the Kaykov. Talaya says that her brother was in the Kaykov, and he was a tactical officer named Arnok. Ed and Gordon express their sympathies, but Talaya seems at ease, knowing that her brother is safe in the hands of Avis, their god. Gordon adds that Arnak was a great guy, so Talaya assumes they were friends. Ed's eyes widen, so Gordon just continues his lie and says that they were close and even took baths together. Suddenly, the service starts, and everyone says, Tamin Emidin. Gordon doesn't catch this, so he audaciously says, Katniss Everdeen, a character from The Hunger Games. Sazeron starts the cleansing wherein he stabs a human head in front of everyone. The Krills cheer as they watch this, but Ed and Gordon can barely keep a straight face. After the service, everyone leaves and resumes their respective tasks. Meanwhile, Ed and Gordon sneak back into the chapel to take photos of the Ankana. They manage to photograph the first few pages, but they're forced to stop when Sazeron suddenly enters the room. Luckily, the two quickly whip up an excuse, saying that they're seeking comfort from the Holy Book, considering that they just lost their ship and their comrades. They quickly leave, but Sazeron becomes suspicious about their true intentions. Later, Gordon tries to scan the photos he just took to translate them. When the Yakar's night shift begins, the two resume taking pictures of the Ankana. Elsewhere, Sazeron asks Haros to place guards in the chapel, as he's suspicious about their visitors. Haros thinks he's a bit paranoid but trusts his instincts, so he immediately sends guards to the chapel. Meanwhile, the emitters start wearing off on Ed and Gordon, and they are now exposed. The guard suddenly enters the chapel, so they immediately duck behind the tables and pews. Shortly after, they manage to sneak out and hide in an isolated room. There, they fix their emitters and learn that a magnetic interference from two decks below is causing them to malfunction. They follow the force's signature, and this leads them to a room where Krills are working on a massive bomb. Gordon wants to leave and warn the others since they've already completed their mission. However, Ed argues that they should investigate what the bomb is for and figure out a way to stop the Krills. To gain more information, the two meet up with Talaya for lunch. There, they learn that the Krills are planning to carry out the will of Avis to destroy a planet called Rana 3 with the bomb. Gordon says Rana 3 is a farming colony with no defenses, but Talaya adds that this is what makes it an ideal site. After this, Gordon angrily tells Ed that they need to warn the Union. However, Ed thinks that they won't be able to send help on time, so they need to stop the Krills right then and there. Just then, Ed realizes that the default wavelength of their emitters has the same frequency as the bomb, which explains the interference earlier. With this, they can create a feedback loop and use their emitters to activate the bomb. Gordon adds that they can trigger an overload remotely in their space shuttle. However, Gordon sighs, knowing that their mission was to make peace, but now they have to kill everyone on board. Ed says there's no other way. As they exit the room to execute their plans, Talaya approaches them, asking if they're free at the moment. The two reply that they are, and so they go with her. Talaya takes them to her class, wherein she teaches young Krill trainees. The kids ask Ed and Gordon about the humans, and the two hesitantly answer. A kid named Koja is particularly more curious about humans compared to his class. 
classmates. However, Ed gets uncomfortable, so he asks Talia if they could come back later. In their quarters, Ed argues that he won't kill a bunch of kids. Gordon reminds him that there are also kids in Rana 3. Just then, Koja barges into their quarters to ask more questions about humans. Ed wants him to leave, but the kid is adamant about learning. He asks where humans come from, and Ed replies that they're from Earth. When Gordon shows him where this is, Koja asks why humans don't look like krills. Ed replies that there's no sunlight on krill, which explains their pale skin. On Earth, however, there is sunlight, which is why they have darker skin that protects them from ultraviolet rays. Ed abruptly stops talking when he realizes what he just said. He politely tells Koja to leave the room, then tells Gordon that they can use sunlight to kill the krills. Their species evolved in darkness, so sunlight can be deadly. He proves this theory by adding that the krill used to wear helmets in their previous battles with the Orville, and this is not for mere military affectation. Gordon's jaw drops when he realizes that krills are basically space vampires. They can amplify the UV end of the spectrum, and the krills would fry up. They only need to place the kids in the classroom with the lights off to keep them safe. The two immediately implement their task. Gordon accesses the ship's internal power grid and sets the timer to 10 minutes before the surge takes place. Meanwhile, Ed goes to the classroom to make sure that Talia and the kids stay inside when the surge happens. As Gordon exits the control room, he asks Ed where their rendezvous point is. Ed gets pissed as he keeps repeating that it's at the bridge. However, Gordon runs into Sazeron, who catches him with a Union device. He lies his way through, saying that he's only part of a cosplay group wherein he plays the human. But when Sazeron finds the emitter in his pocket, Gordon's true nature is unveiled. In the classroom, Ed discovers that Koja went out to look at the stars. Just as Ed is about to leave and retrieve the child, the alarms sound off, announcing that he is an intruder. With their cover blown, Ed shoots the lights and pleads with Talia to keep the kids in the classroom until he returns. Talia demands an explanation, but he tells her to do this in her brother's honor. With four minutes remaining, Ed fights off some krills as he searches for Koja and Gordon. Meanwhile, Gordon gets interrogated by Haros, so he explains that the Union initially wanted to make peace with the krills by reading the Ankana. Haros doesn't believe him, thinking that they're only after the bomb. At the peak of his anger, he stabs Gordon in the leg. Just then, the pilot announces that they're now entering Rana 3's orbit. Haros tells his men to prepare the bomb, but Gordon pleads with him to pity the defenseless colony. Haros doesn't listen to him, but instead twists the dagger on his leg. Two minutes remain, and Ed luckily finds Koja. He fights through the krills and brings the child to the classroom. However, Haros has already fired the bomb. By this time, the surge is seven seconds away from commencing. Suddenly, the ship radiates a strong surge of light, and everyone on board gets fried to death. Gordon, on the other hand, merely gets a sunburn. Still shocked by everyone's death, Gordon reminds himself of the crisis at hand. The bomb is heading to Rana 3, so he limps his way to the control panels, attempting to stop it. He quickly launches two missiles, which detonate the bomb before it lands. Gordon releases a sigh of relief as this is executed successfully. After this, he contacts Ed, and his comrade confirms that he's safe with the kids. Finally, Ed explains the truth to Talia. The Orville also happens to reach the Krill ship, and as they're about to shoot it, they get hailed. When they get into the call, they see Ed and Gordon. Kelly is happy to see them, and she asks what happened. The two say that it's a very long story, and Gordon just asks the crew to prepare a thousand pounds of aloe vera. Later on, Ed speaks with Talia and says that the kids will be returned to their families. As for her, he can't be sure of what awaits, but she will not be harmed. She doesn't trust him, given that he just killed her crew. However, Ed points out that they were about to kill a hundred thousand people, so they had to stop them. When Talia asks why he saved the children, Ed replies that they're not his enemies. However, she says they will be, given what they've done today. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.